Principles one theory with uh, NF uh, fundamentals and NF anti fundamental, NF fundamental and NF anti fundamental chiral multiplets. Um, if anyone has any, you know, if anyone has any questions or comments about that, this is a good time because we're going to switch, switch topics. So, any discussion? Okay, great. So, of course, if you have any questions, you can bring them up at any point. Um, the uh, next, in the next few lectures, our attempt will be um, to understand the physics of uh, uh, of the following theorem. Hmm. Consider n equals one Yangmill's theory. Um, we will eventually look at SUN theories, uh, but to start with, we'll look at the simplest of these theories, the SU2 theory. Mm. Um, so, as you remember, the field content of this theory is W alpha, the gauge multiplet, and any matter that you may choose to add. Okay. Now, what we're going to do is to add one chiral multiplet to this theory, but keep the chiral multiplet this time in the adjoint representative. Okay, so we're adding one chiral multiplet to the theory, but with the chiral multiplet this time in the adjoint representation. And we're going to study the theory whose uh, uh, superpotential W is equal to zero. Okay, so the UV theory is going to be defined by one, uh, one uh, you know, vector multiplet, the W alpha, one chiral multiplet in the adjoint representation, phi, and a superpotential equals zero. Okay, so in n equals one language, our Lagrangian will be um, e to the uh, will be phi bar e to the power v phi, where v is in the adjoint representation. Okay, and this is d four theta plus d2 theta w alpha w alpha square plus cc. And there's, you know, a, a coupling constant here, tau, which is 1 over g squared, or 1 over g squared plus i theta hmm. uh, plus cc. So this is the theory we're going to study over the next few lectures. Okay, is the UV, UV definition of this theory, uh, is the UV definition of this theory clear? Okay, so from, from the point of view of our previous lectures, it seems like a rather simple generalization of what we, what we did before. Previously, we studied the theory of, with uh, NF flavors of quarks and antiquarks with no UV superpotential. Maybe we generalize later to adding a mass square. But other than that, you know, the Bayer theory had no UV superpotential. And uh, um, the same gauge fields. Here, we've made one simplification. Instead of looking at SUN, we're looking at SU2. And one generalization, instead of looking at, uh, um, instead of looking at uh, uh, the theory with, uh, um, uh, with, uh, uh, with fundamental matter, we're looking at the theory with, with um, uh, adjoint matter. Now, the first thing is this. Because the adjoint representation is a real representation, uh, we don't need to double the matter content in order to get an anomaly free gauge there. Okay, for the, uh, uh, for, the, for, the, for the quarks, for the fundamental quarks, we need to have as many fundamental as anti-fundamental quarks. Otherwise, the gauge group would have become anomalous. The gauge symmetry would have become anomalous. Okay, uh, because the adjoint representation is real, it's, it's the same as its complex conjugate. Okay, the same thing doesn't happen. The anomaly vanishes. It's exactly like the vanishing, the cancelling between one quark and one fundamental quark and one anti-fundamental quark. In its, because the adjoint, if you can think of, is being made of a fundamental and an anti-fundamental product. Okay, great. That's good. 
So this is, this is the theory and in some ways looks simpler than the theory we studied before. Okay? But you may... Uh, we're going we're to we're trying to study the IR physics of this theory, okay. like we did in the previous lectures. What is the IR dynamics of those those theories? Okay. Well, the difference looks at this level very small. Instead, in the UV of having uh, quarks, uh, which are the fundamental representation, we have, so to speak, quarks in the adjoint representation. It's the only difference. And we've got only one adjoint quark. Uh, later in these lectures, we will generalize to the study of many adjoint quarks. We will generalize to the study of many um, SU enter rather than SU2. And depending on how it goes, we might look at a very large generalization of these theories, these Gaiotto theories. Okay. Theories of class S, sometimes we will call them. Okay. But at the moment, we just... Um, you know, this is the theory we're going to study. Okay, excellent. Now you might think this is a pretty specific theory. Why have I chosen to think, uh, study this theory? And the reason I've chosen to study precisely this theory, uh, the thing, make, thing that makes it really different from what we did before, is that this theory, although it's not manifest, it's not obvious in the language we wrote it before. Uh, happens to preserve not just n equals 1, but n equals 2 supersymmetric. Okay? So you see, the way we've written it here, the in bosonic language we had a gauge field, and we had a gauge genome. And then we had a scalar field, and its superpartner, let's call it the Chiolino. But notice that unlike in the theories we studied before, these two are pretty similar because both the gauge genome and the Chiolino are now in the adjoint representation. Okay? And this theory has a symmetry, uh, we will see it in more detail. Okay? This theory has a symmetry which allows one to rotate between the gauge genome and the Chiolino. Okay, in fact, let me at this, at the um, simplest level, uh, explain this point immediately. Okay, so at the simplest level, what I'm going to do is just, just take this, this, this Lagrangian and expand it in, in components. Okay, so this is the kind of exercise we did very much, uh, you know, explicitly early on in class. If you remember, I promised you that after a certain point, I will just give you the answer. Here, I'm going to just give you the answer, right? Well, you know how to do this, right? Okay. So, uh, uh, let's see where are we? Is cyber written paper? Is that this place? Okay, so when you expand out the, um, the Lagrangian, um, you get the following. You get 1 by g squared times trace of minus 1 fourth f mu nu, f mu nu. This comes from here as usual. Okay. Uh, plus theta f wedge f um, 
and this is by 32 pi. Anyway, there are some numbers. Okay, that's the pure gauge part that came from here. Okay, then you get plus d mu a mod squared a in this notation that I'm using phi is equal to a plus theta psi. So a is the scalar field in phi. Okay, so d mu mod phi squared and then there is you know the 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 kinetic terms for um, for the gauge eno and the kinetic terms for the chiral eno. This is d slash, d slash lambda. Okay, and then there are some Yukawa terms if you remember. Okay, there are Yukawa terms, which is the Yukawa terms are i square root two lambda psi a star plus uh, complex conjugate. So minus i square root 2 lambda bar psi bar, lambda bar and psi bar, complex conjugates of lambda and bar, uh, psi, uh, a, and then minus half a star a square. Everywhere, the, the stress is outside the whole thing. Okay, uh, so let's see if all of this looks sort of familiar. This guy here, this guy here was the D term. Do you remember that we got, uh, that we had uh, uh, for an adjoint theory, D was equal to, uh, was equal to A commutator A bar because of the FABC business. Okay, remember for a U1 theory it was five phi bars, five phi bar with the charge. Okay, that for the uh, for a non-abelian theory generalized to uh, the, uh, the the FABC phi A phi bar B. Okay, and then we took that mod square summing over all A's. Okay, so this thing here was the D term potential. Okay, it was the thing, the only potential for the scalar field that we have, given that we have no super potential. Okay, these guys were the Yukawa terms that if you remember we um, carefully derived in the mathematics seminar room when we had the, the corresponding lecture then. Okay, and the, they come with commutators. The commutators had their origins in FABCs. FABCs in the adjoint repre representation is commutators. Okay, uh, these kinetic terms of course we recognize. They are just kinetic terms of the scalars and the fermions. Kinetic terms for the scalars and the fermions. And the kinetic terms come with a covariant derivative. Which one? Psi, psi, one of them is psi. Oh, for both, for both. Covariant, covariant, right? Because both of them are charged in the adjoint. Wouldn't be gauge invariant if it was not covariant. Right? And then, of course, there is the pure gauge part of the Lagrange. Okay. Psi is the n equals 1 super partner of phi, just like lambda is the n equals 1 super partner of a. Okay, I'm now going to show you that in this Lagrangian, uh, there is a symmetry that allows you to change uh, between psi and lambda. Okay, so, so okay, so the Lagrangian is clear. Okay. Now you see the following. Let us do the following. Let us call um, psi, let us call it chi1. 
and lambda we will call it chi 2. Okay? So, we have we are calling psi, uh, psi chi 1 and lambda chi 2. Now, oh, one of them, sorry. Uh, these kinetic terms, of course, include bar uh, on one of them. Okay, uh, but these guys do not. These are psi uh, lambda and psi, not with the complex conjugates. Okay, so now I've got these. I've got these two two fermionic fields, chi i. Okay, and let me perform. A rotation um, m chi i prime is equal to m i j chi j on these fermions and try to find what rotations I can perform so that the Lagrangian remains invariant. Let us first look at the kinetic terms. If m is a unitary 2 cross 2 matrix, kinetic terms are clearly invariant because it is contraction of a complex conjugate with an index which is invariant under unitary transformations as usual. Okay. So, if we want the kinetic term to remain invariant, unitary. Okay, so far so good. Now, let us look at the uh, uh, these Yukawa terms. Since the commutator is anti-symmetric, okay, we can equally well write the Yukawa terms as i square root 2 by 2 epsilon ij, okay, uh, chi i chi j a star and something similar for the other guy. Now, epsilon i j is a symbol that is not left invariant under arbitrary u2 in rotations, but it is left invariant under su2 rotations because under a rotation it picks up a factor of the determinant of the matrix. So, if the determinant is 1, you know this, right? If the determinant is 1, this leaves this rotation invariant. Okay? So, we see something very interesting. We see that if Mij is an SU2 rotation, then that leaves this Lagrangian invariant. But now let us see what, the, what this means for the algebra of the theory. We already knew the theory was invariant under an, um, uh, we already knew the theory was invariant under an n equals 1, uh, under n equals 1 supersymmetric. Under the n equals 1 supersymmetry, um, uh, under the let us say the r symmetry of the n equals 1 supersymmetry, lambda was charged but chi was not, but psi was not. Hmm. But now we are rotating lambda into, chi, into psi. So, this is a, this is what, what, what I have tried to show you is that this is, this SU2 is a symmetry that does not commute with supersymmetry. It is obvious, right? Because under supersymmetry, A takes um, the gauge field is taken to is taken to the gauge eno, whereas the scalar field is taken to to psi. Right. But if I, I have a symmetry which acts on the on the, the on the fermions but not on the bosons, now this starts mixing it up. Mm. So it clearly doesn't commute with supersymmetry. Right. Okay, so we've got a bosonic symmetry which does not commute with the supersymmetry. But we've already classified all such algebras. We've classified all algebras that have bosonic symmetries that don't commute with supersymmetry. The most general super, uh, uh, algeb algebra of this sort was the extended supersymmetry. 
Okay. Now, clearly we cannot have more than n equals 2 supersymmetry in this algebra. Because if you have n equals n supersymmetry, you have n gauge genomes. Because each of the supercharges can act on the gauge, gauge field to produce uh, a fermion. Here we have only two gauge, uh, two, so it's maximum, it's n equals, only possibilities are n equals two. And uh, if you remember our discussion of supersymmetry algebras, n equals two in four dimensions allowed for a U2 R symmetry. The R symmetry was the part of the symmetry, the bosonic symmetry that did not commute with it's an internal bosonic symmetry that did not commute with supersymmetry. So this is what's going on here. Clearly we have at least an SU2 R symmetry. We have an, it's an R symmetry because it does not commute with supersymmetry. Clearly we have at least an SU2 R symmetry. Perhaps if we think harder we will find and at the classical level it's true, we will actually find the, uh, okay, let me tell you about that, uh, that, that already. Let me tell you about the one additional symmetry that is al also there in this Lagrange. The one additional symmetry that is also there in this Lagrangian is the usual U1R symmetry. Okay, this is the, U, the, the usual U1R symmetry is the symmetry that acts on, uh, uh, under which the phi field is left invariant. Okay, under which the phi field is left, um, uh, is left um, invariant and uh, the lambda field picks up a phase. Okay, and we could try to combine. Uh, um, right, you're right, you're right. The, 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 you're right. This would, you see, but this is not, then this is not SU2. Right, but then you're making lambda, uh, you're, you're making uh, uh, psi also rotate. Psi rotates under U1R. Psi doesn't rotate on. Oh, yes, psi, psi rotates on. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. You're right, you're right, you're right, you're right. You're right. If they're, yes, 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 sorry. You're right, sorry. Yeah, I, I, you're, you're right. Uh, Chintan's right. The usual U1R symmetry is part of this, is part of this. But there is another symmetry. There's another symmetry, which is just the flavor symmetry of rotating the whole chiral multiplet. Right, I just take phi, the whole chiral multiplet, okay, phi to e to the power i alpha phi. Thank you, Chintan. Yes, I was saying it wrong. Yes, there's another, there is, there is another symmetry, which is just phi goes to e to the power i alpha phi. This is a symmetry of the theory because there's no superpotential. In the kinetic term, it's clearly symmetry because it was phi with phi dagger. Look at it in the n equals one form. It's clearest that way. Okay, uh, potentially superpotentials break such symmetry because you could, if you had a phi cube or a phi square in the superpotential, this would not be a, a symmetry. But we don't. Okay, so this is a symmetry. Okay, let's look at what this does. What this does is rotate psi only, not 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 lambda only, but also rotate A in the same way. Okay. So now if you looked at the Yukawa terms, the terms here that could potentially break such symmetries, every other term uh, either involves gauge fields or ha has field and complex conjugate. So phasing symmetry is obviously symmetry of the other terms. Okay, but if you look at the Yukawa terms here, of course as you see, they come with a psi and an A star or a psi star and an A. So this is also a symmetry. Okay. So we've got an extra U1 symmetry. Okay, now um, it is let me see how there is a conventional way to combine this U1 with I think the diagonal I was talking about. Yeah, so let me now combine this. Let me com combine this with the diagonal part, this, uh, the, the, the one of the SU2 symmetries that uh, I was talking about to get an R symmetry. Okay, so, 
Suppose we look at the symmetry in, under which A goes to e to the power i alpha A. Psi goes to e to the power i alpha. No, I think I'll, I'll put minus. Minus uh, i alpha psi. But lambda goes to e to the power i alpha lambda. I mean, and this I probably need a minus 2. Right? As Chintan had explained to us, just lambda going to e to the power i alpha lambda and psi going to e to the power minus i alpha la, uh, uh, psi was the diagonal part of the SU2. Okay? So what I'm doing is combining the diagonal part of the SU2 with this flavor symmetry. I'm doing that so that it becomes an R symmetry. This combination is an R symmetry. So now I've got, I've got uh, and something that was in addition to the SU2. It's different, right? Because it's, its action on all fields is different from the SU2. And it's a new symmetry. Moreover, it acts on the, uh, uh, on the gay geno. Okay. Um, it acts on the gay geno, giving it charge one. So you might have called it, it is a potential U1R symmetry of the N equal, in N equals one language of the N equals one, uh, of the N equals one theorem. Okay. So what we have is for a, a symmetry which is this SU2, which we wrote down before, and this additional U1, which I'm going to call U1R. Okay. In the classical theory, these are all symmetries of my theory. Okay. And uh, um, it's sort of clear that this classical theory Therefore, is going to have n equals 2 supersymmetry, preserving some R charge. You, you remember that a theory that has supersymmetry does not need to preserve the whole R symmetry. U2 is only the largest possible automorphism algebra that an n equals 2 th supersymmetric theory can preserve. Okay? U2 is only the largest possible automorphism algebra the n equals 2 supersymmetry can preserve. Okay. Um, uh, you, uh, in, um, maybe, 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 sorry, maybe what I'll do, just to make it look more like an R symmetry, I'll do this. Psi. And uh, this was e to the power. Let me call, let me, let me look at this guy. This guy now looks like, like it would be on the psi lambda sector, completing SU2 to U2. Right, because it acts with phase, phase, diagonal phase. So said this way, now it looks like we've got an, a U2 R symmetry. Okay? So it's plausible at least, and. It's now easy to check and I'll explain this in many different ways. Uh, but it's plausible at least that this theory has n equals 2 supersymmetry and at the classical level preserves the full U2R symmetry. Okay? All good? Excellent. Uh, I will have to check if Cyborg and Witten define their special R symmetry in the same way as mine, but I, I, we'll come back to that. Okay, fine. Uh, this conclusion is true. At the classical level, this theory defines an n equals 2 supersymmetric theory. Now, the next, que uh, the next question is quantum mechanically. Quantum mechanically, okay, quantum mechanically, what, which of these symmetries is preserved? Even classically, we have three symmetries. Four. Uh, we have SU2R plus the flavor symmetry. We have the original SU2s under which the scalar field, for instance, was neutral. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, that is there. But apart from this S, you combined S, U1. I combined a new symmetry with some part of the old symmetry, but that's a new symmetry. Okay. So, because there was, let's, for counting, let's not combine. For counting, I had three in the SU2 and one more flavor symmetry. So, linear 
combination. Some linear combination. I'm choosing a convenient basis. But the number is clearly 4. Okay, this phi going to e to the i alpha phi is subgroup of uh, color SU2. It's a different. Of color SU2. Why, why are you saying that? Let, let me say, I was not clear. Let me say it again. Okay. We had the original SU2. Is that original SU2 clear? It acts only on the fermions as an SU2 action. That part is clear. In addition, we had a flavor symmetry. Nothing to do with gate symmetry. Mij. Mij. Okay. Yes. yes. Acting only on the two fermions in an SU2 manner. Then in addition, we had a flavor symmetry which acted only on phi by phasing it with a U1. So that's the fourth symmetry. Now, you might have said this is a flavor symmetry. It's not an R symmetry. But remember, it acts on the gay genome. Uh, it acts on psi. And psi is part of the R symmetry now. So anything that acts on a fermion can now be converted, you know, can be thought of as an R symmetry. No difference between lambda and psi because of the SU2. Okay? So now I've just made a convenient linear combination so that it's in its action on the fermions, it upgrades M from SU2 to U2. The price you pay is that when you do some action that is SU2 but not SU2, you also have to act on the scalar field A in order for this to be symmetric. But who cares? That's the symmetry of the theory. Is this clear? Okay. It was d mu a, mod d mu a square. A square. That was kinetic. Phi is, phi is a f scalar phi, uh, chiral multiplet that, combi that combines a and psi. Are you talking about the n equals 0 action or the n equals 1 action? No, no, said, yes. This. It's just the usual kinetic term for a scalar field. All clear? Okay, excellent. So, this theory classically preserves n equals to supersymmetry with the full U2 R symmetry. And we've just seen the action of uh, the full U2 R symmetry on, on, this, on this thing. Now, we've been trained, right, through all our discussion of this, uh, this cyborg business, we've been trained to be careful that some symmetries that are preserved classically mean, need not be preserved in the actual theory because the symmetries may be anomalous. So let's immediately check that. Let's first take, check the SU2 part of the symmetry. So what are we worried about? We are worried about global gauge gauge. At the moment, we're not trying to do some anomaly matching or anything like that. We're just checking to see whether the global symmetry is a symmetry. Okay, could be violated by instant terms. Uh, so, global gauge gauge anomalies are what we have to look for. Right? But uh, remember the formula for that involved this T1, T2, T3 completely, uh, uh, completely uh, symmetric combination of T1, T2, T3 trace. And uh, if we put an SU2 current there, by definition the trace is zero. Because the other two generators lie in color space. Nothing to do with this SU2 space. Okay? So if you put an SU2 current that's zero, so the SU2 is obviously non-anomalous. We don't have to do a calculation. Clear? Not, not so for the U1. The U1 is not obviously non-anomalous. So let's check this symmetry as I've written it down. Let's check whether it's anomalous or not. Well, now we are sort of masters at this, at this game, right? Um, so, d mu j mu of this U1R, of this guy, is what? Well, it is equal to 1 over Diksha 32 pi square. F where F, this is the thing which integrated gives integers into, any, into some number. Now we're very good at computing these numbers. 
what is the rule for computing the number? Well, we have T, T, T. Two of the T's are from the gauge. So we care about the gauge representation. Gauge representation of all fermions. So firstly, what about the, group, the symmetry, the U, U1 charge? Both psi and lambda, as I've written it, have charge one. Okay, so there's one. Multiplying what we get from TT for the, for the gauge. TT for the gauge, what was our rule? Every adjoint contributes to NC. Fundamental contributes one, and the adjoint contributes to NC. Okay, how many adjoints do we have? Two adjoints. So we will get four NC and NC is two. So we will get two into two into two. So we get two into two NC. This is because two adjoints. Two NC is because adjoint. Uh, 2 NC number of, um, uh, no, 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 no further factors. This 2 NC is the group theory of the color. Yeah, TATB. No other factors involved. Okay? There were no further flavor indices or anything like that. We've counted the two. Right? Th these were the two, the, the multiplicity. Because there were two fermions, each of which contributed this much. Okay, and so it's equal to 8, 1 by 32 pi squared, F wedge F. I mean, no integral, but fine. Is this clear? Okay. Now, what, what does this tell us? It tells us that this U1, this additional U1 R symmetry that I, um, that we wrote down is not a true symmetry in the quantum theory. But is it completely not a true symmetry in the quantum theory? You can combine with that one, right? The flavor symmetry and make some linear combination. Well, we've got our SU2 and this. So we shouldn't overcount. There are totally four symmetries. Three of which remain symmetries, the SU2. And there's this. So this is broken. Number of continuous symmetries is just three. No juggling around will change that. Because one of the four is broken. Okay? However, that eight is important. That eight tells us that there is a discrete Z8 symmetry left over in the theory. Okay? So, First sight, first sight, it sounds like there is a Z8 times SU2 symmetry in the theory. But if we think about it for a minute, so um, we, we see that actually there's a little less. What's the little less? You see, how does the Z8 act on the fermions? Um, this Z8 acts on fermions uh, as the what put the boson? Okay, so the Z8 acts on fermions like e to the power i two pi by eight n psi. Psi goes to this, and lambda goes to this. Okay? But, let us consider the, the special case. Uh, let us consider the special case n is equal to 4. Okay? For this special case, um, uh, we have psi goes to 
minus psi and lambda goes to minus lambda. Okay. However, recall that we already knew that the psi and lambda were invariant under SU2 rotation. And there is an SU2 rotation, namely rotation by, uh, by 2 pi, which turns spinners to minus themselves. So at least on the fermions, at least on the fermions, the action of uh, this Z2 subgroup of Z8 is identical to some element that was already present in SU2. Even in symmetry. What? Say that again. Even Lorentz symmetry will have psi going to minus psi under 2 pi. Exactly. It's, it's very similar. It's just fact about SU2. A fact about spinners. No, for any SUN also we will have the same. For any? SUN. Certainly for any uh, SON, this, if you think of this as an SO3, certainly for any SON you, in a spinner representation, you will have a, an element of SON that takes all spinners to minus themselves. Yes, uh, is it true that under in SUN, yeah. Uh, okay. Right. 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 Uh, right. But of course, as as Chintan has reminded us, we're talking about SU. You know, there are many SU twos in this game. There's SU two R symmetry, and there's SU two color. And at the moment, we're not talking about SU two color at all. Okay. Um, fine. But actually, now that as I'm saying it, I'm getting a bit puzzled because the action on the fermions of this thing is, ah, and there we go. But there's also minus, note that the, that the boson has an extra factor of 2. So under this, psi goes to psi, when n is 4, psi goes to minus psi, lambda goes to minus lambda, and a goes to a. So this is precisely an element that was already pre present in the SU2, SU2 flavor. So if we think of that symmetry, the original symmetry is genuinely an SU2, I mean, not an SO3. But genuinely an SU2, so it includes these two pi rotations. Okay? Then this Z2 of the Z8 was already present, uh, present in that flavor SU2. Okay? So really the additional symmetry we have it's not Z8 times SU2, but SU2 times Z4. Is this clear? Now, later in our analysis, we will be particularly interested in the operator trace phi square. This beautiful chiral operator, this beautiful chiral operator that will parameterize for which we will, you know, we were particularly interested when discussing cyborg duality in uh, bosonic chiral operators. For instance, for trying to find their super potentials or to try to parameterize moduli space. In the same way, we're going to be particularly interested in uh, gauge invariant bosonic chiral op, this gauge invariant bosonic chiral operator. Okay, we will be particularly interested in it. Note that the Z4 symmetry that acts, um, uh, that acts on this trace phi square acts as phi goes to e to the power i, al, i, i n 2 pi by 8, but into 2 because on the boson it acts with a factor of 2, maybe with a minus, it doesn't matter. Uh, no, it's 2 pi by 8 where n is equal to 0, 1, 2, 3. 
That's what makes it Z4. Right? We're treating, we're treating things that are differ by multiples of four as the same. It's that kind of co-setting. Right? But in fact, that co-setting happens automatically in its action on phi. Because phi had charge two. So any two things that differ by four act trivially on phi. Okay? So we have this kind of action. Um, and on trace phi squared, on trace phi squared, there's an additional factor of two. So trace phi squared goes to e to the power minus four, uh, minus two pi i n into four by eight. So there's a z2 symmetry effect. You know, a z2 subgroup of the z4 acts on trace phi squared. The two different elements of the z2 are n equals zero and n equals one. N equals 0 acts as identity, and n equals 1 transforms into minus itself. Okay? So we've got a Z4 symmetry left over in its action, action on fermions, that full Z4 is operative. Okay? But in its action on bosons, uh, on gauge invariant bosons, on gauge invariant bosons, only a Z2 subgroup acts. Well, we will, this will be important for us as we, as we move along. Okay? Fine. So this is what I wanted to say about the component-wise analysis of the UV Lagrangian and its symmetries. Any questions or comments before we proceed? Okay. So now, now that we understand the theory a little bit, we're going to ask ourselves, what is the question we're asking ourselves? You know, what is the, what do we want to know about this theory? Please. So just like for the, uh, for the previous n equals to one case, we defined this u1 r prime symmetry, which was some linear combination, which was more anomalous. So yes. we could say that q's yes. that Yes. Yeah. Why can't we do that here? That's the question. You see, in the previous case, classically we had, Let's count the symmetries. Let's it, remove the non-abelian ones. So, of course, there was the SUNF left times SUNF right. Ignore those. Let's play no role. But you had U1 left, U1 right, or equivalent to U1 baryon, U1 axial, and U1R. So, we had three U1s, one of which was anomalous. So, it became two symmetries, which we called U1 baryon and U1R, or sometimes we called it U1R tilde. Okay, now let's do the accounting here. Remove the SU to the, the non-abelian part. How many symmetries did we have to start with? One. And that was anomalous. Okay, so there's nothing we can do. Right? Number of symmetries you cannot change. You can change what you call, you know, the you can take linear combinations and change what you call them. Clear? Excellent. Other questions? Excellent. Yes. Because if an n equals, if the theory is n equals 2 like, uh, supersymmetric, it is in particular n equals 1 supersymmetric. So always you can write. Always. You have to choose which n equals 1 supersymmetry you want to keep manifest. Once you've chosen that, you can write. Right? We can just forget the fact that it was n equal, n equals 2 supersymmetric, regarded as a special case of an n equals 1 theory. Now, provided it has a Lagrangian, you know, maybe you're asking a deep question. There is a. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but just since this has come up, there is this very interesting question. I don't know how clued in you, are, you guys are to it. But there is this very interesting question of this. Do all theories have a Lagrangian? Let's take one minute to uh, understand what the question means. You see, 
one could imagine an abstract definition of a quantum field theory. Let's say a con conformal field theory. Where you have operators in the theory, you have correlation functions, and that's it. Now, in that abstract definition, what is the role of the Lagrangian? The way we think of a Lagrangian is this. The way we think of a Lagrangian is that it gives us a weight for the path integral. So effectively, the question that we are asking is, do all theories have a path integral description? And if so, path integral over what? You see, suppose we take n equals 4 Yang Mills theory. The abstract operators of the theory are gauge invariant traces, trace of blah, blah, blah. From looking at that list of abstract operators, it's very hard to say what you might want to take a path integral over. For instance, the list of abstract operators, if you keep only those that stay light, look very much like you should be taking a path integral over gravity in ADS5 cross S5, because those, those operators in one-to-one -one correspondence with those of gravitons. Okay. However, we believe the right answer, right quote unquote, is to take a path integral over the fields, n cross n matrix fields, of n equals 4 Yang Mills theorem. This is sometimes very far from apparent from the answer. What path integral generates that answer? Okay? And I'm not even talking about very fine details. I'm just talking about what are the fields in your path integral description. Okay? Now, people who study, you know, uh, let's say 2D, 2D CFTs in abstraction, often think of the field theory as being defined by the field theory data which is like correlation functions. And then you, you give me a set of data that obeys all rules. How do I know what the path integral that generates it? And how do I know the, whether there even is a path integral that generates it? Okay? And you know the law when I was growing up as a physicist, when I was a PhD student, the law was that there are, exist non-Lagrangian theories. Not every theory has a Lagrangian, which is a very stupid way of saying it. I mean, what I think the people who, meant to, who said it meant to say is not every theory has a path integral description. I think that's the content of that mm. statement. Because when you say path integral, you have to say path integral over what? Once you say path integral, there's a weight for the measure. And whatever that weight is, we call it. That's a Lagrange. Okay. Uh, however, this, this belief that there exist theories that are non-Lagrangian has got weaker with time. Because uh, people have taken non-Lagrangian theories and found Lagrangians for them. <laughs> Previously, they showed with arguments that there can be any Lagrangian or we can't find Yes, there were, there were arguments that there cannot be any Lagrangian and the typical... Uh, what? There are some TF uh, topological field theories. There are some topological field theories that do not that do not have Lagrangians? Yeah, maybe. Uh, uh, how sure are we that they do not have Lagrangians? I think in, there are some mathematical theorems. That yeah. Paul Bias says that most topological field theories are non Lagrangian. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I don't know this theorem and I shouldn't comment on it until I see the details. Bias is always very speculative. Always very speculative, but you know, the problem with mathematics is mathematics, a theorem always makes assumptions. Okay, and usually the mathematicians get their theorems right, but what is wrong in these arguments is the assumption. So let me give you an example. A famous example of a non-Lagrangian theory when I was growing up was the M2 brain theory. The theory on the M2 brain that we were many times told by all the famous people is a non-Lagrangian theory. And the argument was, there were many arguments, but the good argument was that no, there was, it was more or less impossible to write down a Lagrangian. So the M2 brain theory had preserved n equals 8 supersymmetry. It was more or less like impossible to write down a Lagrangian that preserved n equals 8 supersymmetry. Okay? At least in very special cases. Karthik's advisor helped clear some of this up. Okay. I mean, Sunil helped clear some of this up. Now, all those theorems were more or less, there were some exceptions. SU2, some exceptions, 
but as, which people had missed. But by and large, those theorems were right. But the result was wrong. The result was wrong because while you couldn't find a Lagrangian that, ma that manifestly preserved n equals 8 supersymmetry, the ABJ, the ABJM Lagrangian manifestly preserved only as n equals 6 supersymmetry, but captured the physics of an n equals 8 theory. Because, you know, some non-perturbative states came down, some monopole type states came, came down and completed the thing and made it n equals 8 supersymmetry. So you see, it was correct that you couldn't write down a Lagrangian, which uh, that manifestly preserved n, n equals 8 supersymmetry. But it was wrong that you couldn't write down a Lagrangian for the theory, because we have a Lagrangian. Okay? So if you're interested in the abstract question, is there a path integral description of this theory? It was incorrect in that case to think that there was not. Okay? And many such examples have, uh, uh, have emerged since. These Arderius Douglas theories, which people have claimed are non Lagrangian theories, the n equals 2 theories. People gave arguments that you could not write down an n equals 2 supersymmetric Lagrangian. Those arguments are presumably correct. However, people have written down n equals 1 supersymmetric Lagrangians that capture their physics, become n equals 2 in you know, the right place. So you see, this is the problem with theorems. Theorems make assumptions. And while stated the theorem might be right, it may not be, it may not lead to the physical conclusion that you think you're, re you're, you're, you're reaching. Okay? People have got less convinced about this because many examples that were held up as classic examples when I was young are no longer classic examples because they're false. Right? <laughs> okay? So it could well be in the end that every theory is a Lagrangian theory. Okay? And that would be sort of nice, right? When we study quantum field theory, we prove many theorems by path integral manipulations. And if there are theorems, theories that don't have a path integral description, all those theorems have to be revisited. <laughs> okay? Uh, now, maybe you can do it from abstract methods and so on, but it would be, it's not pleasant to give up the path integral. It's a nice thing. And until we're forced to give it up, you know, taken kicking and screaming away from path integrals, we won't do it. And I don't think there's a clear reason we have to do it yet. But since we started this, uh, I'll go back quickly, but since we started this digression, one other important point. Now, you know, there's this question of does every theory have a Lagrangian description? There's a second question, is that Lagrangian description unique? And here the overwhelming evidence is the answer is no. What does it mean that you have two different Lagrangian descriptions? This is what we call a duality. Hmm. We have two different path integrals over two different sets of fields that produce the same endpoint answer. Okay? So there are plenty of examples, though outside two dimensions, few proofs of theories that have uh, many path integral descriptions. Okay? So that's what duality means. Two different path integral descriptions of the same abstract physics. If you only had abstract physics, there's no duality because it's one theory. <laughs> okay? So this whole question of the interplay between path integrals and the abstract quantum field is a very interesting one. It's a question of understanding dualities. It's a question of whether path integrals make sense. Anyway, this was an aside because of Diksha's question. Let's, let's, go, uh, let's go back to this. Sorry. Okay. So, Clear this aside out of your mind, and let's go back to this n equals two. Okay, great. So, uh, yes. Yes. Can be completely different from each other. And but the field number of fields can be completely different. Like in. And, and how the correlation functions will be like then? Like yeah. How will count that the data is exactly the same? Well, the yeah. It should be true that there is a map between gauge invariant local operators, for instance, between the two theories. This is very different from the fields being the same. For instance, in cyborg duality, we had cyborg dualities with same number of flavors but different number of colors. Colors could be wildly different. So the number of fields can be very different on both sides. 
But we believe the number of gauge invariant operators is the same. Okay? So that cyborg duality was an example of trying to build two different path integrals for the same physics. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. Um, excellent. Okay. So, uh, so, 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 so let's let's keep going. Okay. So now the question that we're going to ask. So now that we understand the theory. Let's introduce the question. What is the question of interest to us? Well, you know, in this theory, as I will soon try to argue, n equals 2 supersymmetry forbids the generation of a superpotential for the phi field. Okay, because we've got this n equals 2 supersymmetry, that already tells us Okay, that this phi field cannot have a non-trivial superpotential. It'll allow something else, but not a superpotential. So already we know, before starting any analysis, that we're going to have a moduli space of vacuum. Okay, what? How is the moduli space of vacuum? What is it like? Well, it's formed from scalar fields that have to minimize the scalar effective action, which is phi, phi bar times phi has to be equal to zero. Therefore, you know, so now phi was a complex field. Right? It was not clear that phi and phi bar commute with each other because it's made up of two fields, the real part and the imaginary part. The fact that the real part and the imaginary part commute with each other, because the real part and the real part commutes with itself. And the imaginary part commutes with itself, but the real and the imaginary part commute with each other is non-trivial. This is what this d, d flatness condition is saying. Now, so that tells us that the two components of phi, the real and the imaginary part, both simultaneously diagonalizable, or more succinctly, the complex field psi is diagonalizable. No, that is not in general true of a complex field. Okay. So this is diagonalizable in SU2 gauge space, right? Okay. So what we have here is some effective field phi, which is which is effectively diagonal. It's an SU2 field. So we have only one eigenvalue to keep track of. Okay. So roughly speaking, roughly speaking, the space of vacua is going to be labeled by one complex number, which is the eigenvalue of this phi field. But we've got used to think, uh, to understanding that it's better to parameterize things by, by gauge invariants. Okay? So how do we parameterize this, this one complex number, um, uh, this one complex number in a gauge invariant way? Well, clearly the thing to do is to use trace phi square. Okay. Um, now some of you are wondering the following. Once I've made something diagonal, its eigenvalues are gauge invariant. So why can't I just use the eigenvalues to parameterize? Why 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 go, go, go to trace phi square? And the answer to this question is that, that diagonalizing something the eigenvalues, you know, diagonalizing something fixes gauge invariance up to a discrete symmetry. This discrete symmetry is the interchange of the two, uh, two uh, is the permutation of the n different eigenvalues. In our case, we have two different eigenvalues. So the most general eigenvalue, most general phi was equal to a and minus a. A permutation, because it's going to be SU2, right, traces. A permutation can take it to minus A and A. So the gauge invariant content in the, in the eigenvalues is the value of the eigenvalue mod Z2, mod sine. But that is precisely what trace phi square keeps track of. 
because trace phi squared keeps track of a square. Okay, so the way to parameterize these uh, these vacua are by looking at the value of trace phi square. Is this clear? So we've got a phi, phi was a complex field. A was a complex field, so trace phi squared is a complex field. So we've got a complex plane. At least naively, we have a complex plane. Okay, and we've got a va one vacuum everywhere on this complex plane. We'll see a little later that this picture is a bit naive, but at least naively, this is how it appears. And the question we want to uh, the question we want to address is what is the IR physics at each point on this complex plane? Sorry, uh, A is complex, right? A is complex. Well, I'm just thinking of phi square by, as my new coordinate. Yeah, so the, in phi square, I've got a complex plane. Yeah, you could think of the map from this to some other space, in which case it's half of that space. But I'm thinking here. Uh, because it's an SU2 field. It's traceless. Okay. Yeah, so had it been SU3, we would have needed more than phi square. You know, needed two pieces of data, right? Roughly phi squared and phi cube. Okay? So we've got the space of vacuum parameterized by this complex number phi squared, which Cyberg had written in the paper called U. And on this complex plane, we want to understand. At each point in this complex plane, we want to understand the nature of the IR physics. Now, you could ask me, what do you mean the nature of the IR physics? What does that statement mean? Okay, so this we want to understand a little better. So first, what can we say classically about the nature of the IR physics as a function of phi square. Classically, what, what is the picture? Well, classically, the picture go, goes as follows. Um, if there is a special point on this plane, namely phi square equals zero, at which point SU2 gate symmetry is unbroken. Clear? Yeah. So at this point, SU2 gate symmetry is uh, unbroken. On the other hand, everywhere else, phi has a wave. Phi is an adjoint field. An adjoint field is the th representation three, the three component representation of SU2. Um, for the next two minutes, it's better to think of SU2 as SO3 and the adjoint field as a vector field some direction in SO3 space, okay? So phi has a wave, it points, and then points in some direction in space. Because it points in some direction in space, SU2 or SO3 is broken down to SO2 because the rotations around that one direction in space are preserved. Don't change the vacuum. But any other rotation does. Clear? And therefore, what we have classically is spontaneous symmetry breaking. Okay. Classically, yeah. physics is spontaneous symmetry breaking. SU2 to U1. Yes, exactly. Locally, it's SO3 to SO2. Okay? Now, if you classically have the spontaneous symmetry breaking, what happens? 
No, no, now I'm talking about color. Okay, so I'm so sorry. There are two different SU2s, which both of which will play an important role in our analysis. And we have to keep our wits about us to know which one we're talking about. Uh, so this was SU2 gauge. Okay, so what is the low energy different, low energy theory? It's a U1 gauge theory. At slightly higher energies, there are two massive W bosons. But when we go to very low energies, we integrate them out. And we get some effective U1 gauge theory. Uh, now, all fields in our U1 gauge theory were adjoint, in ICU2 gauge theory were adjoint fields. So what we'll be left with is adjoint fields of U1. But when we talk about U1, adjoint is a big word. Adjoint means uncharged. So what we're going to have at low energies is a U1 gauge field with one neutral scalar and two neutral fermions. Would, what? Would, would that be an uncoupled? Yeah, decoupled. It would be basically, up, I mean, it would be decoupled if the Lagrangian uh, was quadratic. Now, there may be couplings because we've got some effective, you know, phi 4 del mu phi square. You know, there may be explicit couplings from the non-quadratic nature of the Lagrangian, but there's no coupling because of gauge boson extension. Right? Yeah, so, but as you say, or as we will see, because there is no potential, all interaction terms have to be der derivative mediated if they exist. And so we'll be weak at low energies. And so the theory we expect to be free in the very low energy limit. Okay? So we expect basically, um, as you will see, basically the, f the physics of what people sometimes call the Coulomb phase which is just free U1 gauge bosons and scalars uh, doing something. Okay, so pretty boring dynamics. Pretty boring dynamics at low energies. This is what we would, we would expect, classically speaking. Quantum mechanically, what we're going to find is while this picture is true almost everywhere, Okay, there are two interesting places where it's not true. Even classically, there was one interesting place where it was not true, namely phi equals zero, where the theory became SU2, the SU2 symmetry with no spontaneous symmetry, big, presumably a confining gauge theory. Okay, we're going to see that this becomes more interesting. Okay, but let's go back to the, uh, to, to now, now we've got the classical physics. Semi-classically, what do we expect the dynamics to be? Well, semi-classically, we expect the dynamics to be uh, computable at large values of phi square. This is for the usual reason. This theory is defined by a certain lambda QCD. It's one of these asymptotically free gauge theories. It's, it's characterized by its value of lambda QCD. If phi square is large compared to lambda QCD squared. Then the running of the gauge boson stops before you reach, before it's had the chance to reach strong coupling. For scales below phi square, the running is that of a U1 theory with uncharged matter. And therefore, it's no running at all. So the running of the gauge coupling freezes at scale phi square. Okay? So when phi square is large compared to lambda QCD, Okay, so we've got this U plane, and we've got this, what should be a circle of radius lambda QCD square. Okay, much far out here, we understand the physics very well. Because this classical picture, semi-classically corrected, is accurate. 
Okay? In here, we don't really know what's going on. Okay? Now, if you were a skeptic, you would have said, well, okay. Presumably, nothing very much changes. You'll have more or less the classical picture, perhaps. Perhaps you will find a few details about it. But it sounds like such a simple theory. What, what, what do you expect to find? Why are you wasting your time? Why don't you look at a more interesting thing? I, this is, I think, what I would have guessed if somebody asked me this question before I knew the answer. Okay. The point is that we're going to find something very interesting. We're going to find that this classical, okay. See, so we're going to have this U1 effect, this effective low energy U1 description. Every time we get massless fields, the effective U energy low 1 description breaks down, right? There's a singularity. Classically, we found that there was a singularity at zero. Quantum mechanically, we're going to find that the singularity splits up into two singularities. And interesting things are going to happen. Okay, so the nature of this manifold, well, you'll see, is going to change. Okay, so this is our first introduction to the question we're asking. We've got this moduli space, we've got this complex plane. As a function of where we are, what is the physics? We expect, and I'm assuring you that it, generically it will be true, that the physics is that of U1, gauge boson, more or less free at low energies, doing not, nothing very interesting, most places. But there are some places where even classically, one place where even classically something interesting was happening. Okay? Now, I told you that the gauge coupling was cut off before it had the chance to run out there. But in here it's not been cut off and we expect that this, this theory is confined. Hence so we expect to see all the fun of the physics of confinement inside here. And that's the kind of thing we want to explore. How much of this can we understand? Okay, great. Now, all this is very good, but it still doesn't sound very quantitative. What functions do we want to compute? You know, when we say we want to understand the IR physics, what, you know, what in mathematics does this mean? Okay, and so to understand that, I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, the general constraints that follow from n equals 2 supersymmetry. Okay. See, this is unfortunately a mer, I mean a technical subject. If approached through superspace, which is a nice way of summarizing the answer. So I'm going to, I'm going to approach it that way. I'm going to tell you about it. And then I'm going to tell you a result, and if you're uncomfortable, we will, go, we will go through the paper that derives it. But first, let me tell you how things go. See, suppose we were interested, okay, suppose we were interested in writing down this n equal, an n equals 2 theory in superspace. Then we know what to do. You know, we've been trained from our old analysis of quantum mechanics and our analysis of n equals 1 theories in four dimensions, how to work, right? We try to write down a superfield phi. The most general superfield phi will now be a function of eight thetas. Okay, there will be theta, theta bar, theta tilde, and theta tilde bar, each of which has two components. And then, of course, there will be XP. Now, you write down the most general thing with eight thetas. Each theta could be there or not. So we will get two to the power eight. That's 256 components. We don't want to, go, I want to go there, right? We know what kinds of theories we're looking at. It has four. That's gauge boson, two fermions, one scalar. That's where we want to go. 256 is far away from that. So, the thing we want to do is to put as many constraints as we can 
on the theory that are consistent with n equals 2 supersymmetry. The first thing we'll do is to make this field chiral. Okay, we will make it chiral so that q bar on phi, sorry, d bar, d bar on phi is equal to d bar, d tilde bar on phi is equal to 0. Okay, this will allow us to solve for phi as a function of theta, theta tilde and y, where y now, I'm not writing down the numbers, but schematically x plus theta sigma, theta bar sigma, theta plus theta tilde sigma, theta tilde. Nothing changes here. Okay, so already that's great progress. Instead of dealing with 256 fields, we'll now have to deal with only 16. Right, because 2 to the power 4. However, 16 is already also too big. We want, want 4, maybe a few auxiliary fields, but the 16 is too big. So, a question that you can ask is, are there any further constraints that one is able to put on this field, also consistent with n equals 2 supersymmetry? We've exhausted all the simple things, but people are clever, and they came uh, and they came up came up with something less simple, but that works. Okay, so I will tell you what. I'll first give you a reference, and then tell you what works, and then depending on your preferences, we can either go through the algebra for this or not. Uh, but first, let me. Don't think of it as operators. These are just fields, e classical e fields. Yes. D and D bar shall uh, act, acting D and D bar with on phi gives you this y video. That yes. Y yes. That so. Yeah. We we want we do exactly what we did in the n equals one theory for this part. We try to find the combinations of x, theta, and theta bar that obey this equation. Set so this. No, the, the fact that D has to annihilate Y tells us that it's in the combination X plus this. Yeah. The fact that D tilde has to annihilate it tells us in the combination X plus this. I, I am, but I am saying, is there any other Ds ah. which will make it more one variable or something? Ah, one variable. I don't know how to say it in this language. Yeah, it's, what I'm going to tell you about is something sort of like that. Uh, but. We we have that, right? So oh you want to theta tilde bar with theta. Theta. Yeah, that kind of things. Ah. Ah. You see what we've done is this. We've made the thing being annihilated by all d bars, whether d bar one or d bar two. So rotations between the you know these SU2 rotations aren't helping us now. Because they only uh, you know take these bars to the bars. But yeah. anyway, no, but what I'm going to tell you is sort of, well, you see, um, maybe, maybe in the next class we can go through the algebra of that a little bit, just since there are, since there are questions. But let me tell you first the result. I have to find it. Okay, um, this is the reference for what I'm saying. Oh, 
Okay. The, 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 this is how it goes. And, uh, uh, okay, first let me tell you the result and then we can, um, we can uh, say a little more. Um, take, suppose I take a general chiral field. Okay, I call this chiral field, I don't know, chi. And I expand it as, um, let me call this chiral field. Let me call the, yeah. Okay, let, let me, I, I expand the chiral field as um, phi plus uh, plus uh, theta tilde w. So theta tilde w. So there's an alpha, alpha contraction here. Okay. And plus theta tilde uh, square g. Okay, each of these fields are still functions of theta. So I have taken the n equals 2 field and expanded it in n equals 1 superfields. Okay, now what we've got here is one fermion and two bosons. Okay, let us suppose that the kind of field we're talking about is the gauge multiplet. So the n equals 2 gauge multiplet. Okay, that's why I've written W alpha here, because W alpha is going to be the W alpha of the n equals 1 gauge multiplet. Okay, W alpha comes from a V. This could be, could have indices, could have group indices. This could be chi A, phi A, W A, theta A with, yeah. Adjoint indices. Okay, uh, uh, people have this. This reference has shown that this, that the following constraint uh, G is equal to d two theta bar phi dagger phi star. Uh, so now everything has an i here, and um, phi star of y minus i theta bar sigma theta minus i theta bar tilde sigma theta tilde times e to the power v. Argument. Okay, that this integral, that this constraint, if you identify this G here, okay, so this, this is very complicated. I just wanted to emphasize that the complex conjugation also acts inside here. If you remember, we saw this when we were doing our quantum mechanics. Um, uh, it should be x minus right? x minus. Thank you. Now the, the, but forget, now that we've understood this, let's forget the details. So I'm rewriting this so it looks simpler. Phi star e to the power v. Now v, remember, was an origin, was a real superfield. What? Same type of field. So it's a function of x's, theta's, theta bars. Okay. Hmm. So these were both n equals 1 superfields. Both this guy was a function of only half, but mainly of the theta bars, right? Okay. This guy was a function of both. Claim you take this 
do this integral here. Okay, this relation preserves n equals two super. You can impose this relation in a manner that is consistent with n equals two super symmetry. Okay, this as for now, I'm not telling you why this is true. Okay, you just so you relate exactly. So this is the main accomplishment that instead of having two scalars here, you have one scalar. I mean, two scalar superfields. Two scale n equals one super scalar superfields. You have one scalar n equals one super scalar superfield. This is enough. This one constraint allows us to uh, to working with these constraint superfields allows us to write down the um, n equals two supersymmetric Lagrangian in superspace, and I'm going to show you how that works. Okay. Uh, again, depending on interest, we will either go through the algebra for this or not. But uh, let's assume this is true for a moment. Okay. Assuming this is true, what do we find? What we do is to take some, how do we write down Lagrangian? We write down a Lagrangian, okay, by taking some chiral superfield and expanding it. Okay, so we write down a Lagrangian by taking some chiral superfield and expanding it. Okay, and so now I'm going to do that. So let's suppose that my chiral superfield, whatever it is, is F of the basic chiral superfield phi. Okay, these are n equals two chiral superfields. Okay, each of them is a function of thetas and theta tildes. Okay, and then we write this, we take this object and we integrate over half of superspace, d two theta, d two theta tilde. For the same reason as previously, this is a supersymmetric thing to do. Because it's chiral, all terms, uh, you remember how that worked, right? If we integrate it over all of superspace, it was obviously supersymmetric. If you integrate it over half of superspace, it's okay because though the Lagrangians are invariant, its variation is always by total derivatives. Because it's only in the difference between x and y that, uh, and that always involves a derivative. Okay, so this is nice and supersymmetric, and so let's write down the uh, the Lagrangian that we obtain in n equals one language. Okay, so what we do is take this and expand it in uh, um, uh, in, in 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 its components. So phi is equal to uh, um, uh, let's put it, put that in. So this phi superfield is some phi is phi plus theta tilde w alpha plus theta tilde squared g. Okay, then we expand this out. So one term is d2 theta and uh, the term where we have only one derivative and we take this guy. Okay, so we get uh, del f by del phi times uh, times g. Okay, second term is where we have two derivatives and we use this guy. So we get plus del 2f by del theta alpha del theta beta w alpha w beta. Is this clear? Okay. So this is our n equals one Lagrangian. This is our n equals one Lagrangian. But now in this n equals Lagrangian, we put in this constraint. Okay. So what this becomes then is d two theta, d two theta bar for the first term of phi bar e to the power v phi, uh, it is a phi v del f by del phi. Right? 
right? Plus d2 theta. Here it's just as it is. Del 2f by del theta alpha del theta beta w alpha w beta. Okay, so what we've done in the end is interesting. What we've done in the end is generate two things. A Lagrangian for the gauge boson. That's the W alpha W alpha term and it's super multiplet. A Lagrangian for the matter multiplet. That's this phi bar e to the power v del f by del phi. Okay, we've generated both these terms. But we see that they're not independent. There is one analytic function for f that controls both the kinetic. What am I doing? Uh, what am I doing? What am I doing? What am I doing? This is phi, right? I'm so sorry. Phi. Sorry. Phi squared W alpha W alpha. Sorry. Right, there was no theta there. So there is one analytic function in this case of one phi field whose second derivative gives the scalar dependence in the kinetic term for the gauge boson. Remember. Kinetic term for gauge bosons was an integral over half of superspace. And we could always have dressed it. We could always have dressed it with uh, chiral fields. This is that dressing. This is the thing we couldn't control at all in, N equal, in the n equals 1 story. Okay? Another thing we couldn't control at all in the n equals 1 story is the kinetic terms for the scalar fields. And that's what's being generated here. And these are being generated in a way that are coupled to each other. You know one, you know, know the other. There is a single complex field F. A single complex field F, holomorphic field F, function F, that generates both things. The kinetic terms for the scalars and the kinetic terms for the gauge bosons. Not unreasonable, right? Because the scalars and the gauge bosons are the same multiplet. It's not unreasonable that the kinetic terms are related. But the point was that because the gauge bosons, their kinetic, their, their kinetic term was chiral. Okay? The kinetic term of the gauge bosons was controlled by holomorphic data. Therefore, the kinetic terms of the scalars is also here controlled by holomorphic data. In n equals 1 theory, in general, it's just some general scalar potential, which is not, not holomorphic. So the power of holomorphicity here now extends to the kinetic terms of the scalars in this n equals 2 theory. Also to the gauge bosons, but that was always true. The new thing here is that it extends to the kinetic term of the, of the scalar and that these two things are related. Now it's getting late and we'll miss lunch, so we'll stop here. But uh, uh, in the next class, what I will do is uh, show you how the Lagrangian that we started from follows from this formalism with a simple choice of f. f will be phi square. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, so we will see that. But that was not the real, real reason I've, talk, I've talked about this. Why have I talked about this? You see, the original Lagrangian, we could so easily write down components. That was the only reason we wanted to study it. It was not worth it. It's, there's heavy formalism, including this constraint and so on. Um, the real reason to talk about this, okay, is, is the following. The U1 effective action we're going to reach at low energies will also be n equals 2 supersymmetric. So we'll also take this form. Okay? Now, wh wh what is phi in that case? Well, it's this trace phi square. So that will become the low energy. 
effective field, right? Of course, because it's a Goldstone boson. I mean, there's a scalar field corresponding to moving in the manifold of vacuum. And the manifold of vacuum is parametrized by phi square, place phi square. There will be a U1 gauge field and so on. And there will here be this function f, which is a function of trace phi square. One holomorphic function of one complex variable. Okay? Which controls the kinetic terms of the scalars. And therefore, you know, all the relevant terms in the effective action. So our mathematical goal will be to find this function f as a function of trace by square, function of u. That is our goal. Find f as a function of u. That is the mathematical problem we wish to solve. OK? Uh, one, uh, one last thing before we leave. Um, Um, this function f has a name. It's called the prepotential. Okay? As you know, the thing that appears, as you know, the thing that appears um, from in front of the, um, the thing that defines the kinetic term of scalars also has a name. It's called the Kähler potential. We get the metric by differentiating this, as you know, metric on the moduli space of the actual actual scalars, not the n equals one supermultiplet. Right? So, in this n equals two theory, we've seen something sort of interesting. N equals one theories always were associated with Kähler geometry on the moduli space of the kinetic terms for fields. N equals two theory is also associated with Kähler geometry, but not the random kind of Kähler geometry. Kähler geometry in which uh, the Kähler potential is determined by a holomorphic function, F. So these are sometimes called, I think, special Kähler or something like that, special Kähler manifolds. So you see that N equals two supersymmetry is giving us new geometry, new, new constraints on geometry. Uh, some of these things will play, you know, play a role in in, in what in what we want to in our discussions next class. Okay, it's one forty nine, so we'll stop. Uh, any questions or comments before we leave? Okay, so now the problem is set up. We know what we want to do. The next question is, how do we do it? <laughs>